Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Johnny Jetzer. I'm for the second time the curator of Art Basel Unlimited. And we have a very special edition this year. First of all, we started with a very large hall. Uh, we get the, the full hall one this year. And that brought us uh, the opportunity to invite even more artists and to have three of them here. To my right, Matt Connors. In the middle, Latifa Echak and Oscar Tuazon. And we have the plan actually to discuss the artwork that are on one hand in the show, but then also to go on and discuss like different issues of Unlimited. I think it's a very special format. On one hand, it's a sales exhibition. On the other hand, it's a museum on time. It's, it only lasts for one week. Roughly there are 65,000 visitors. So it almost takes the nature of, a, of an art festival a very vivid presentation. And what is quite special for me as a curator is that uh, you can build walls, and much more walls than in any museum of the world. Roughly this year, two kilometers, so 1.3 miles of walls. So you can kind of create a parkour, or you can try to bring the artworks in the best spotlight possible. For me as a curator, the most important thing was to rely on great artworks and on great artists. And I think that's the best way to make a great exhibition. So we're going to start with Matt Connors. And maybe we're going to look through uh, his installation. The work that he shows in Unlimited is Demonstration Red and Blue. It's a brand new work. It has been created for Unlimited. It consists of uh, walls that are quite high, six meters high five meters wide, and actually it's a two-folded wall. You have a freestanding wall and a second wall leaning against it. Just a little bit of information on Matt Connors. He's born in Chicago. He lives in LA, although he spent most of the early summer in London this year. <laughs> and uh, he had different solo shows at Kunsthalle Düsseldorf, PS1 MoMA, uh, Dallas Museum of Art, the work that is presented here, like in general, it's kind of funny because there's an essay by Roberta Smith that she, worked, that she wrote for the New York Times that is entitled, uh, Is Painting Small the Next Big Thing? And <laughs> somehow the tension was already in there that maybe a small gesture can contain a, a large format and vice versa. But it's quite astonishing uh, when one looks at the exhibition history of Matt Connors to see actually the scale of this work. It totally exploded the exhibition space that he had so far, but somehow the, the discourse <coughs> within painting that he created at the smaller, in a smaller format just went on in this uh, work demonstration, blue and red. So it's described as a grand gesture to demonstrate the margins and uh, was, I, I couldn't help but also to think about Joseph Albers, actually the artist who kind of also introduced a very special relationship between the size of the canvas and uh, the figure actually, or the form on, painted on the canvas. And I want to ask you, Matt, first to give us maybe a little bit of an insight, like how you approached this invitation and or if it was like a long time dream and and how you came about to create demonstration red and blue um it's i have done a couple of smaller scale versions of this that were meant to react to uh the galleries that they were in but so therefore no all all have been basically half the size um but those ideas were born out of painting basically and it was just a um desire to kind of I always think of it as kind of theatricalizing the the ideas and the gestures I'm doing inside of painting, and it just seemed to be a super, on the one hand, a really dumb idea, just to want wanting to see this um, juxtaposition of forms in in real life outside of a painting, but on the other hand, it yeah, it was, seemed super very organic um, towards just what I've been thinking about inside the painting. So when I the first time I did it it kind of gave me permission to kind of stop having to think about painting in general as like 
as my venue, I guess. And then when this idea to, to um, I've done two or, two or three walls like this, and they've been a little bit more um, subtle, <laughs> a little bit more invisible. And, I've, and then I transpose it to a, f a couple of floor pieces too. Where Actually, in your show at PS1 MoMA, you were leaning already canvases, yeah. but like small size canvases against the wall. Yeah. Is there any relationship between leaning the real thing against the real wall? I mean, it's, I mean the, I, I've been really attached to the gesture of leaning. Um, I think I initially just copied a Richard Serra piece and turned it into a painting, um, like one of the early prop pieces. I just, I ended up kind of accidentally recreating that within a painting and that, um, yeah, I just, it felt very satisfying instead of like pictorializing relationship to actually creating a physical relationship, but it didn't, it actually doesn't feel that far outside of painting to me. And I've, I've always been a little bit opposed to scale for its own sake. Um, back when I used to make smaller paintings, I felt kind of political about making small work or, or just felt like things needed to be, um, you needed to kind of demonstrate the necessity of a scale of something. And so, but, so this idea initially seemed a little bit ridiculous to me, um, but the further I, I was able to kind of pic picture it, the, the kind of minimal and possible invisibility of it within, and within such a grand scale would really appeal to me. Um, and it's also just kind of within the kind of thinking of, I, I kind of think of it as a drawing kind of, a uh, much more casual gesture than a, I just want to, I want to see these two things next to each other. I want to see what they do to each other. I want to see them this big. Um, it's not like a, it's not like an ego. Like I, I always get mad at scale when I think it's kind of forefronting the artist. I, I just kind of think it was a natural outgrowth of my general process, which is kind of problem solving and experimentation. Um, so once I got over being afraid of, or I, you know, I was thinking of myself as a maker of smaller things, um, but this still feels, to me, it feels very small still in a way, this work, even though it's six meters high. Tell us a little bit more about the idea of duplication to basically get into a serial mode to do two of those. Well, that, to me, the, the, that there's two of them is very important because, I, I mean, I wanted it to be experienced over time and to um, maybe, I mean, I've had that so far this week, I've had a bunch of people say that they missed it or they didn't, that, or they didn't see it, which has been like, to me, like my favorite reaction to it. Because I, I, I think uh, it's made out of the materials of Art Unlimited. It's made, it was built by the kind of construction team. It's, um, it's kind of uh, a little bit like camouflage, like, it's, it's direct, it physically and material it relates directly to the fair, so that there's, um, it's kind of hiding in plain sight a little bit. And the, the red one a little bit less so because it's super bright, but I don't know, I just, um, the, and I just think um, it's a, yeah, the, the gesture kind of confirms itself when you see it a second time. And I think the, the, the structure of Unlimited, you kind of have to, come back, you have to, you kind of can't get out there. You have to re-encounter all the works. So I think I'm also playing with that with my work too. And is the size set or can it be adapted to the, to the wall height of a museum <laughs> or? I mean, it's my, this, the spirit of it for me is to just, is a, is a more playful and experimental. And if, if it ended up, I'd love to see it. Um, it ha I mean, to, to me, the size for this one related directly to the to that hall and the fair. So it relates, it's pretty much tied to its location. But I mean, it could also be outside, I guess. But that would, you know, we're working on, it's, it's, uh, it's, yeah, I don't know. It could go in a lot of different directions. Maybe a last question. Is it the first painting where you didn't apply the color yourself? Um, no, I've used, I've, used, I've been using um, framers and different kind of uh, like fabricators that kind of live within the realm of painting as more like pure fabricators. So I've made a couple pieces that were just frames with nothing in them. I've just kind of, I've been kind of slowly, um, cause it's basically, it's not so much about a physical, it's not about my hand really. It's about like wanting to, it's about forms and wanting kind of wanting to see what would happen. It doesn't have to be my hand, but yeah, it's, it's the largest one where I haven't done it. <laughs>
thank you, Matt, no for this introduction to your work. The second position we have and the second artist present is Latifa Echak. She was born in Morocco. She lived many years in France, but eventually moved to Martigny, uh, Switzerland. She was represented the Venice Biennial in 2011 and the Sydney Biennial 2012. In general, she explores issues of cultural transfers and the shifts of uh, identity that they entail. And it was quite surprising, actually, when I saw for the first time this series of works that you created for your solo show at Kunsthaus Zurich last year, and to see, actually, that you do a whole show on circus and the culture of circus. And, of course, uh, there are like certain elements that um, are in, in sync with your previous work. Um, for example, the emptiness or the aspect of something uh, missing, of the absence of things, the sense of abandonment. And I thought that the statement that you gave about the circus is really interesting, that the circus actually represents the idea of the spectacle that lives entirely from the tension of the moment. And that the theme of your piece is, is precisely the end of this here and now, which is much more about absence. So, uh, Latif, I want to ask you to tell us a li little bit more about this idea of the circus and how you modulate it. And you presented it in a slightly different form at Kunsthaus in Zurich. It was more open, like the circle was not complete. And also the presentation of the, of the props was slightly different. <coughs> uh, so, <coughs> in, a, in the Kunsthaus Zurich, it was... It was uh, more about the architecture of the space because I have, I have to I had to deal with uh, walls, columns, and also a space that is not so wide cubed. So there, there is there was there were a lot of um, uh, elements that could stop a, a large installation. So in Zurich, I really work with that. Uh, um, uh, Problematic, so the the the, cir the circus uh, circle was just broke in the space, so it starts and it finishes in a disorder against the wall, and uh, and there were two costumes of uh, one uh, August, like a, one uh, funny clown and one serious clown. So it was like a, the end of a conversation or like a conversation about the end of something. I don't know. So it was it was a special set in a way. And uh, in this case, you have the title "Horse and Figure," so yeah. it's a, much more about the evocation, actually, of that almost also relationship between the horse, which is the yeah. performer, and mm -hmm. and the figure yeah. that is more the the control organ or like the the commander. Yeah, and the figure it's also the gesture when, like in sport or in uh, in dance or something, when uh, what we call a figure is a is a position. Like mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, it's it's also about uh, the gest gesture in a in a way. And uh, so I I started this kind of work in uh, I think in, yeah I think in 2003 the first time about setting. Uh, um, an installation without any uh, direct performance, and uh, and then I, I go on after in, in some work with uh, fanfare or um, some also some personage and thing and and that at that moment I, I really wanted to explore the, the the world of the circus because it's uh, it's something like a um, um, uh, like a child, a childhood uh, memory, but also uh, it's also the circus is a, is really the concentration or the the it's like a radical event. It's really one space, on one really short period of time, and then there is another numero and another acrobat arrive and uh, with uh, another set and something. So it changed very fast. And the, uh, and the event is very uh, short, also and powerful. So it, it's a, it's a good um, it was a good uh, element to work with because uh, 
because yeah, five minutes before, five minutes after, it's already over. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe mm. you can say a little bit something about liberating objects, which is kind of a, a, a key element in your work mm -hmm. that you use objects, but that you are always very cautious to kind of uh, detach them from their functional presence and identity. Um, I, th I think objects do not need really to have a, um, a human to, to use it to really exist. Uh, I think if you, if, you, if you see this kind of object like the horse material on the, on the costume of the, uh, of the acrobat, uh, you have a thinking of the acrobat and you think about the horses without... Uh, Without making uh, the necessity of the presence of the of the of the models, and uh, and uh, so it's uh, it's one hand about the idea of the still life, uh, like in a, like in painting when you set uh, when you have to set uh, things in a table, for example, and then you can start to paint it or to photograph it. And uh, here I try to set it, uh, but leave it like that. Or on the, on th in the other end, it was also how to prepare um, uh, a performance without the performance. Uh, so I did it very seriously in a way, like, like uh, for all the work before with the fanfare and thing. So I, I, I really was in dialogue with people from the circus. Uh, Uh, fa fabrication, so, so the costume was made with a four dancer and we talk about a lot about the technicity, about how fast it will be to change the costume and things like that. So, so I, it was uh, a way also to enter in that world and, um, and to, but to do not uh, finish the, the, the action in a way. Mm -hmm. and, um, mm. At some point I ask myself if there is a certain complicity between the human and the animal because they both left and it seemed to be that they both left at the same moment. Mm. You know, so that they kind of uh, mm. uh, took the decision to leave the circle and to, yeah. to go elsewhere. Yeah, something, um, yeah, something <laughs> about uh, freedom and the wild, I don't know, and the wildness, I don't know. And, uh, uh, yeah. A last question for you. In the press release of the Kunsthaus show, it's, it's written that it's also about the inner emptiness of our event society. And of course, Art Unlimited is part, I guess, of an event-driven presentation of art. Yeah. And can you relate to that interpretation or would you reject it? I won't reject it at all, but I won't, uh, it wasn't the, the main, uh, it's one of the lectures possible. But uh, it's absolutely about that. But it's also absolutely about uh, every work in general, on every artwork in general. So the more, I, I don't know, the, there's a lot of, uh, and especially unlimited in a way. It's, there is, it's also an occasion to, to have uh, almost no limit. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but it's also a frame, so it's, uh, I don't know. So I, I, don't, I do not reject at all. I think it's, yeah. uh, it's really part of the, the lecture, but not only for this uh, venue uh, precisely. Thank you, Latifa. And the third artist present today is Oscar <coughs> Tuazon. He was born in Tacoma, Washington, and uh, lived for many years in Paris, but he moved a couple of months ago to Los Angeles. He founded in Paris the collective-run artist gallery Castillo Corrales. He studied at Cooper Union. In 2011, uh, you might have seen one of his para pavilions at the Venice Biennale. And he was present in, in many shows this uh, past months and past years. Uh, he also presented a new work for Unlimited, a free country from 2013. It's a structure built out of steel, aluminum, and concrete from 2013. And uh, in general, his work is about the approach working with and against the entropic, entropic qualities of natural materials. I think uh, 
a, a sentence that makes a lot of sense for this work. For me, it was quite thrilling also to see um, how intelligently the form was chosen because as you might see, the aluminum structure has, I think, used to have only right angles, which got deformed, and the steel structure actually has pointy angles that seem to have much more tension in them. So it's a lot about the, the dialect and the, the dialectics of different metals, but of different forces also, and actually the potential of expression that is also in the deformation. Very often in the work of Oscar Toison, there are traces of physical labor. And uh, it's, it's a shift that has taken place a couple of years ago that he used to work a lot with your, you, used to work a lot with your own hands and sought to work then at a the larger scale with the help of, of others and of a whole studio facility and the workshop. And there's a wonderful sketch in the, in the catalog of Unlimited that shows uh, the idea at the very early stage. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit more about like, the different phases, maybe problems you encountered? Well, it actually comes from a, a series of works that I started maybe five years ago or something. And there, the, there were structures built in a gallery space and suspended from the ceiling. And, and so there were structures that would collapse under their own weight but be suspended by the ceiling and directly connected to the, the space of the gallery. For me, that was a way of um, saying that the work is contingent and it depends on the space and it can't exist outside the space, that, that, it, that it really needs the gallery as protection, support, um, context in a physical way. Um, so I'd done that always with this gantry, you know, a heavy thing kind of collapsed and suspended from, from a gantry, from a hook, from a chain. Um, and that's very clear. But then coming in this situation, I guess, um, I, maybe it's just that the ceiling is so high. <laughs> um, I, I, I didn't, maybe I wanted to go a little further with the work and, and rather than this kind of maybe more, I wanted to reactivate that dynamic within the work itself, that it could actually be a standalone work that, that was determined and formed by that physical process. In this case, it isn't something collapsing really, it's, it's two structures deforming each other. But to me, I guess um, that's, that's the starting off point was these earlier works. And so to, to me, that's, that's really interesting. And I, I just, I think I'm realizing that now having seen it in the space, what a difference um, those two methodologies are, even though in my mind, they kind of came from the same place. So um, I think on this slide, we see very well the the concrete basis of the two structures. So, so there are two structures, and one is uh, slid into the other. And then you, you got these cables, and you started to pull actually on one structure that crashed uh, slightly mm. into, into the other structure. How, how important is the... Obviously, the pick of material is very important because the, the deformation was from the beginning an, an, an important factor. Mm. But how much can you control the deformation, and how much does it look like what you... Um, I'm, I, I'm getting a bit better at it, I think. Um, uh, but it's, it's, it's hard to um, anticipate. Uh, it's a, it's, that's also part of the... the Strange, it's, it's a piece that's designed kind of backwards. Um, that um, there's a hypothesis from the beginning, and then um, I try and figure out how how that's going to happen. And in a way, it looks very, very. I mean, it looks obviously very different than the sketch, but um, even then. I would have imagined it while we were building it, you know, that's kind of... 
Can you tell us something about the title, A Free Country? And in, in many other works, there, there's quite a bit of a, a relationship between the words and, and the object. I would actually say, I mean, there is a relationship, of course, but I, I like to think of them as almost two separate pieces. That there's, the, there's the work, and then there's the title, and they, they have an interaction, but it's not a descriptive reaction, and it's not a, a hierarchical reaction, that those are two separate and equally powerful <laughs> forces that um, end up uh, engaging each other. Um, so the title specifically, um, I guess uh, it's just a, one of these strong phrases. Maybe it's just because I just moved to Los Angeles. But it's one of these things where it's, the, it's like the description of the United States. But then at the same time, um, Depending on context, it can take on a kind of, um, I don't know, you know, when you say, it's a free country, it, it takes on a different, um, it takes on a different context. It can, it can take on an adversarial tone or um, it, it can, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a little poem. Last question, tell us a little bit more about this destruction as a mean of expression. Because like, I mean, you, on one hand, you, you quote almost this language of engineering and of building structures that are rock solid. But on the other hand, I mean, for an engineer, your structure would be broken, probably, and would have to be discarded while you are, are looking for this specific expression of destruction. Hmm. Um. I would, I mean, I see what you mean. I wouldn't call it, I wouldn't like think about it as, as expression necessarily. Um, I think it's, uh, it's the way things go. It's, it's the, um, like dealing with gravity and forces of physics, um, but in a very intuitive way. I, I actually, like in, while I was thinking about this, one of the things that I thought was interesting from a, structural standpoint or an engineering or architectural standpoint would be the idea of, of designing a structure that is, I mean, that's what I did, is meant to collapse and thereby, like, creates the form of the structure. And in my mind, I kind of thought, well, the, you know, if you could build a house or a building that way, um, it really inverts the, the normal status of design and, and like the, the, the capacity of, of a person as a designer, you know, like you give over a lot of, um, uh, yeah, maybe expression, but, or, or, or um, you give over a lot of control to um, this not quite predictable physical process or the, the process of materials. Um, to me, that, that's like a, a really exciting frontier for um, making an object, you know, like set up a set up a, a situation. And I think at the beginning you planned to make the structure even larger, mm -hmm. and yeah. and you shrank it a little bit. Yeah. What were the reasons for that? Um, well, the ostensible reason was to fit it on the truck. Um, <laughs> there are always these kind of I like that, the, you know, these practical decisions that end up, like, telling you what to do. Um, but I was really happy, like, at that moment where I had to make that decision, it, it became human scale also. Um, and that's what I like a lot about um, the size of it right now is that it's something that when you walk through it, it feels close to the scale of your body, even though it's quite large. And then there's this funny moment where you can kind of sit there, um, although the security guards don't like this very much, um, you can sit there and it's a bench and you can kind of lean your back or you can stand and lean your back up against it. Um, so it has that like human scale, one-to-one -one aspect. Thank you very much. I don't know if you guys have questions amongst each other. I think what is quite great about this talk is that each position is so distinct that there is no way actually to compare uh, the positions, which I think is one of the core elements of Unlimited, 
that it's not a group show built up on familiarity, but rather on contrast and being different. So I think uh, it's, maybe, it's maybe the most natural format of a group show because it, it asks the artist to be highly eccentric and not to kind of uh, uh, hold hands with each other, but just like do their thing. And like each position, each of the 79 position is really valid. And uh, the title that I use in my essay in the catalog is a palimpsest of contemporary times. I think it's quite interesting that this, this cloud of contemporary lasts for over 30 years now. And uh, each generation of artists uh, is, is a part in this dialogue and takes in a voice in this dialogue. I think it's also very beautiful in Unlimited how the whole dialogue gets transgenerational and that some pieces uh, that were made, for example, Mark Kamikaimovic's piece from 1972 that seems to be totally timeless, or at least that, that I would uh, expect to be from maybe the late 90s with all these individual methodologies and the use of private objects or of objects as private objects rather than as ready-made or goods of consumption. So I think it's very, uh, an interesting format because it's, on one hand it's highly competitive, but on the other hand it's also quite protective for the single position of the artist. And maybe it reflects what the, the early 21st century is about. Uh, a, a very competitive open field of many voices and of many possibilities to make contemporary art. I would like to open the discussion for your questions and I don't know if we have a microphone. What is maybe funny is that uh, you talk about palimpsest, palimpsest and in a, on the same time I have the feeling that the three positions that you invited all have to do something with uh, some invisible forces somehow. And it's funny that you have this, um, curate, cur you're curating this show about being big and everything is very subtle in these three positions, almost disappearing. It's not really a question, it's just a break. Sounds almost like a compliment. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Yes, hi, I'm Edward. I just wanted to ask Oscar, what type of artist have you been influenced by in, in the past? Let's say, of, hmm. from modern times. Um, and why, if so? Too many to know, <laughs> too many to count. Um, uh, but, I don't know, one person I think about a lot right now is Scott Burton. The, the American sculptor, furniture maker, um, who existed on a sort of very vague boundary between architecture, sculpture, and, and furniture, and I guess the simple reason that he's so compelling to me is that it's always um, engaging this question of the body, and um, in not such easy ways, like he made really uncomfortable chairs, I think, and um, that's, that's something I think about a lot. <clears throat> and would you think about uh, creating furniture in the future? Would that be a possibility? I've tried, yeah, I've tried. Um, <laughs> some, some have been more successful than others. Um, but I think that's like the um, uh, that's the prerogative of um, making a sculpture that looks like a chair is that um, that you can really exist in this uh, double space and you can um, failure is permitted and um, uh, yeah it's also a way of doing things that. Um, maybe a little bit like Matt was saying, things that can be invisible, 
because a chair can really appear as a chair. It also, like, as you're sitting in it, um, you don't look at it. Um, so then it's, it really has this invisibility. And I think that um, in contrast maybe to this situation, um, the, the, the space of invisibility as an artist is to me one of the most exciting places to be. Um, it's a very broad, utopian, endless space. Do you want to react to that statement, man? Um, I mean, I've been kind of working towards that within the painting, my paintings, like focusing on the what's not really there, the edges. And I mean, my first thing I look at in artwork, I like scooch up and look at the how it's attached to the wall or what's on the edge. Or and like, I, yeah, I think like the more you work as an artist, those the the center becomes less and less exciting to you, um, and the uh, the incidentals and I mean what Oscar was saying about putting forces in play and 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 letting them do the thing and creating the in my work the imagery um, is also that's also kind of goes hand in hand with the space of invisibility because it doesn't correspond to like a um, I think like when you stand in front of a abstract expressionist painting your brain does this thing where you see you just automatically conjure a hand mm. making a mark and I think in a, in a like in, a, in these these edges and borders and accidents and automatic things, um, that's kind of taken out of the process and it kind of frees up a lot of brain space. I think so. I, I mean, that's definitely where I'm looking for inspiration and like ideas and happiness. <laughs> in your case, Latifa, maybe a last statement for you. You're working with absence. Is it different if you're working with small objects to evocate absence uh, compared to to the the large circus ring? I did a lot. I did some very small objects. In a I know. <laughs> 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 and uh, but it's not. I I never really look for. I I I. I Never plan really the sizes or the colors, for example, because I think I, I am not a very good colorist, or I, I'm not at all a good. Uh, uh, I, I would be a, a very bad architect, for example, or a really bad painter, maybe. Or, but I do painting, in fact. But I don't know. Uh, but uh, it's, it's always more about organizing and, and installing yeah. things rather than. Than finding existing. a way to design them. Yeah, exactly. On existing objects, it means that I have not too much decision to take. I just have uh, all my decision. It's uh, how I can uh, uh, end it uh, with one object. How it could end it. So, what kind of gesture I can make for one object? And for example, the one of the smallest uh, object. That uh, you know, that I, I show, for example, uh, in a movement on complication in, in uh, the Swiss Institute in New York. It was a, a world map that I scratch until a little ball. So to crumble to a yeah, ball. Yeah, crumble to a yeah. ball. Yeah, a little ball. So it's small. Mm. And uh, at, uh, but a world map is not too big, in fact. So it, the size is I. It's not really mm. my my plan. But, but it's definitely not like that, that the absence grows exponentially with mm. the size of the installation. Probably yeah. it's much more difficult actually to, to advocate the absence by, by getting large. Yeah. yeah, but it could, I don't know, it's a good, uh, it could be a good challenge, I don't know. I, sometimes I just follow uh, <laughs> the object the, uh, itself, but... Uh, but I think it's a uh, um, art is a is a good uh, playground to just free the object from their own uh, utility, and this is exactly where uh, I found for myself uh, the freedom as an artist because nobody expects nothing for what uh, what we are producing. It can fall, it can break, it can just uh, and uh, it's it's a, a very strong. Uh, um, um, yeah, freedom. 
answer. Yeah. Thank you very much. Let's end on this freedom. Thanks, Oscar. Thanks, Latifa. Thanks, Matt. Thank you very much for your attention. <coughs>